We are in Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 13. And this is an account which is in all the Gospels, of the Synoptic Gospels, meaning Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And this is Mark's account of it, beginning at verse 13. And they were bringing children to him, that is Jesus, so that he might touch them. But his disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Permit the children to come to me, and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands on them. Father in heaven, we come before your throne of grace asking that you might grant us an understanding of what it means to come to you, to come receive your kingdom as a child. We pray that you would, through your spirit, make the book live and transform us to be more like your son. We pray in his name. Amen. So someone comes up and asks you, how does one get to heaven? What kind of answer do you give someone? I did an internet search, and you put in the query asking about how do you get to heaven, and you find tons of websites that give all sorts of answers, and most of the Christian answers have kind of a similar theme, but there's other answers out there for sure. And the Christian answer is usually in the form of a gospel presentation, but the essence of it is biblical, coming from the book of Acts in many places where you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's a, a right answer to, to have faith, to have belief. It, it means you, you put your trust in Jesus Christ and who he is and what he's done and what he promises. And when we consider all those things, who he is, he's, he's both God and man, as we've been learning in Sunday school. And he was yet sinless, so he could be the perfect substitute for us. And he died on the cross to, to pay the penalty for the sin that we deserve. And then he was resurrected so that he can give us resurrection life. And, and he promises to come back again and, and make a new heaven and earth and restore things where righteousness will reign and we will be in his presence forevermore. And that is a good, that is a right answer, a right understanding of how we get to heaven is by trusting in him for all of that. But in our passage today, Jesus gives an answer that we usually don't find in some of those websites, and an answer that might not always be in our presentation of the gospel either. It says, you must become like a child to go to heaven. Verse 15 is very strong. It says, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child, he won't enter it at all. And when he's, when he's talking about the kingdom of God, or in Matthew, the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about heaven, really a new heaven and new earth where God's reign is manifest and he is over all and we submit to him willingly. It, it's talking about salvation, and this is a passage that we're, we're very familiar with. We, we sing songs about how Jesus loves the little children. We have our pictures on our family Bibles. But we don't want to let our familiarity with this passage keep us from seeing what Jesus is teaching. Because this is a serious statement. Unless we receive the kingdom of God on the basis of, of this childlikeness, we'll never enter it or rather maybe more positively, those who are like children are the only ones who will enter the kingdom. And this is a passage that often gets misunderstood. We think, well, it means we need to have the faith like a child, so trusting. And, well, there's some truth to that. That's not quite Jesus' point. Rather, his point is, is that the kingdom of God is for the helpless and the weak and the needy. How much of that concept is in our understanding of who goes to heaven and, and how we present it to others? And how much do we even see ourselves as, as little children in this way? And, and also, how do, we, how do we bring other little children to understand these things? I mean, 
we don't just tell little children, hey, just be as you are. That doesn't really work as you get older, right? There, there's something that we need to understand about this childlikeness that we need to have a good understanding of. And Jesus has a, a couple lessons for us on this about who goes to heaven. As Jesus teaches his disciples, he, he gives us some lessons on, on first bringing children and being like children. Those are the, the points in your outlines. And I hope as we go through this, we'll have not only a fuller understanding of the gospel, but a fuller resting and who Christ is and what he's done and our hope of heaven and it, that it would shape our discipleship for ourselves, one another, and, and especially towards children. So let's look at the first point, bringing children to Jesus. So this is another one of those passages where we see somewhat of an unflattering side of the disciples. Jesus has to get indignant with them and correct them and as, as we've been going through Mark, on the one hand, we've seen that these guys have great privileges. They're, they've been selected by Jesus to be his followers, to learn from him, and they get commissioned with his authority, even his power, and they're, they're given the secrets of the kingdom as Jesus teaches them, and they're the ones to promote his ministry. But on the other hand, Mark's been showing us that they don't really get it. They couldn't understand some of the parables and Back when Jesus had fed the 5,000 to 4,000, they didn't, they didn't really understand what that was all about. And, and they certainly didn't understand when Jesus talked about being crucified. Right after that discussion, they're, they're in this argument about which one of them is the greatest. And there they are grasping for status and full of pride. And they lack dependence. They lack prayer. And it seems that, that Mark in his gospel particularly uses the disciples' lack of understanding to teach us better about Jesus' way of discipleship. And I, I, think, I think it's so helpful because Mark understands that some of the things that his disciples struggle with are a lot of the things we struggle with. We need to continually remind ourselves of, of Jesus' way because, like, like all of us, we, we, we live in a world that, that values accomplishment and, and pride and, and money and self-centeredness. And their attitude and, and our attitude, when we, we are focused on those things, works out in how we minister to others and how we represent Jesus' ministry. So by way of this negative example on how they react to people bringing children to Jesus and how Jesus reacts to them, I, I think there's some, some lessons for us to learn. So, so let's look at what they did. So here we are, verse 13, and you have... People bringing children to him, and the they there, and uh, we, we learn from the rest of the, the sentence there, it's, it's masculine. It's not just mothers. It's probably mothers, fathers, families, older siblings. They're bringing their children to Jesus. And then the disciples are, are using this severe language. It says they rebuked him. They're rebuking these Families were trying to bring their little ones to Jesus. And in that language, it's, it's used severely in a couple of places. This is the language that Jesus uses when he rebukes evil spirits to cast them out. This is the language Jesus uses for the furious storm and the waves when he wants to calm it down. And it's also the language that Peter uses when he rebuked Jesus for saying that he was going to the cross. And, and Jesus turned it around and rebuked him, saying, get behind me, Satan, because you're not thinking God's thoughts. That's the, that's the word rebuke here. And, and here these disciples are rebuking these families who are just bringing children to see Jesus. And when we put it like that, it just seems so wrong. And by Jesus' response, we know it is wrong. Now, we often... Look at these cluelessness statements and these things that are going on, and we think, well, maybe we do better. Right? We do that with the Old Testament and with Israel. It's like, boy, can't they see God's providing? And they always grumble and things like that. Why don't they just trust them? Well, we're not quite in their shoes, and it's helpful for us to maybe get in their shoes a little bit and, and understand what's going on and, and, and figure out why are the disciples trying to prevent them from bringing... Their children, the Jesus. What's their, what's their thinking? Well, first we need to back up a little bit and say, why were people bringing their children to Jesus in the first place? 
verse 13, makes a simple statement that they brought him to have Jesus touch them. It's not really out of the ordinary. People have been bringing others to Jesus all throughout the Gospel of Mark. They're coming to be taught and, and even touched to be healed. The sick were brought. The diseased were brought. The, those with evil spirits were, were brought. And there were so many people who came that Jesus couldn't even stay in the villages anymore. Remember, he had to go out into the wilderness to get away. And usually when people came, Jesus had really profound teaching or, or some, some miracle that testified who he was. Really tangible things. And, and those miracles, they served to testify who Jesus was, that he had power and authority. And the disciples, they came to, to understand that he was the Christ. He was the Messiah, God's anointed one who would bring in the rain. And, and he had the signs to prove it. And the disciples understood that kind of people coming and, and doing a miracle to testify something. But here, though, these children, they're not being brought to be taught. They're not coming because they have an evil spirit or, or to be healed. They're just brought because they're little. They're little children. The word there is a word for infants or babies. In, in Luke, it specifically brings out babies. The, the words used earlier in Mark for a 12-year-old. So it's, it's probably a range from those who could be held in the arms to those who could walk on their own because Jesus says, come to me. And, and they're not looking for a touch of healing, but just blessing. And that's what Jesus did in, in verse 16. He, he, he blessed them. He put his hands on them. Matthew talks about that the parents brought him there to, to lay hands on him and pray for them. They recognize through Jesus' reputation as he's traveling on his way to Jerusalem that this is a great man of God. And parents seem to have a practice in those days where they would take their little ones to a rabbi or the elders of the synagogue and ask them to pray for their children. Now, maybe we can understand it a little bit better if we understand that they're in a culture where infant mortality was much higher than what we're used to. It was common that at least some of their kids probably would not make it to adulthood, a pretty high percentage. So we can certainly understand where they might want to have a holy person pray for a blessing and, and ask for God's favor. You know, typical blessing in those days, maybe the parents expected something like this, that the children would come to, to know God's ways, know his law, to, to grow up, to be faithful in their marriage and in good works, and, and just looking for their children to, to make it, to be faithful followers of God. So that's why they were coming. They, they wanted a blessing. And that's a, it's a good desire. And Jesus welcomed them in verse 16, and he took them and embraced them, and, and he prayed. And, and we don't know what he prayed, but we can believe that these children did have God's favor for whatever he did pray for them. But the disciples, they didn't see the parents' desire for the children being blessed as that important. They, they kept them from coming to Jesus. They're trying to block access. They're, they're acting like bouncers, these gatekeepers who get to determine who gets access to Jesus and who doesn't get access. It's kind of replaying the attitude that we saw back in chapter 9, verse 38, when the, there was this one who was casting out demon in Jesus' name, and, and they, they wanted to prevent him. And Jesus says, no, don't, don't prevent. Don't prevent him from doing that. And the reason they were preventing him because... This guy wasn't in their inner circle. He wasn't one of their little inner group there. But here, why not let the children come for a blessing? Well, we talked about this earlier in chapter 9, that the children, they weren't looked upon in that culture in quite the same way that we look upon children. Now, we know that from the Proverbs and the Old Testament that, that, that the Jews saw children as a blessing from the Lord. But it's not because they were cuddly and cute and they loved to play with them. Their view of blessing was more about posterity, continuing the family for another generation, or, or even having some more laborers in the workforce as they got older. So, so when they're seeking blessing, it's, a, it's an eye towards the future. They didn't have the sentimentalism about children that we have. It just, just wasn't the same like where, 
we have politicians who go around kissing and holding babies and that endears them to the populace because it's all oh, that's so sweet and everything like that. They just didn't have that same kind of regard for children. And the Romans had even less regard. There's, there's accounts in historical records of just mass infanticide and, and abortion that was just common, especially female children. And you, you would have records of these babies being exposed, basically left out in the elements to, to die. And you, you have parents just you know, giving their kids off that. And the unscrupulous would sometimes pick up these kids and they would raise them to be either gladiators in the games or even prostitutes. They were just disregarded. And there were, there were no social activists who basically were advocates for the children trying to protect them. They didn't have that type of protection. They were vulnerable and defenseless. So when the disciples saw the little children being brought, they're, they're looking at it through the grid of their culture. And it all seemed like an unnecessary and an unprofitable bother, at least for what they thought was going on, what they thought the agenda was. And then probably at the same time, they're, they're throwing their weight around a little bit and acting with their own sense of importance and what they think the agenda should be because because, hey, we're on kingdom business here. You know, we're with the Messiah here. We're going to bring in the, the kingdom. And, and children aren't significant enough. They don't offer anything for the cause. And they really can't add anything. They're just not strategic for advancing this kingdom that about to come in. And, and I think that it's, it's like a peasant trying to get an appointment with a very busy king who's about to go on a crusade and and this peasant tries to get an appointment to ask the king to help him tie a shoe or or to talk about the weather or something trivial and it's basically hey he doesn't have time for this it's not important so they probably thought they were protecting jesus thought he had more important things to focus on they had the wrong priorities and they had the wrong understanding of Jesus' mission. Not a bad intention, but wrong values. And that's what happens when any of us can get out of sync with Jesus' priorities. If we're, if we're not careful to listen to him, I think of uh, a friend of mine who was a youth pastor. And he's all focused on getting his lesson ready for the kids. And one of the kids came up to him and had a real problem, was really hurting. And he basically blew the kid off because he was so focused on getting his lesson ready that he disregarded and dismissed this little one. And he was so convicted afterwards that he, he allowed the means to get before the ends. Because that's what he's there for, is to minister to these little ones. And so often... We can get our programs and our activities that kind of block us from what the purpose is. Why are we really doing these things? And, and we, we just miss what real ministry can be. It can take us off course. Jesus is indignant towards his disciple. It's it stirred up in him anger. And, and, and you can imagine that it must have been his, in his tone or in the manner in which he spoke because Mark records this. He puts this, this strong word down, probably from Peter's account because Peter had a, a memory. He didn't just say it all gentle. Oh, let the little children come. He, he was indignant. And Mark records that here. And I think it's interesting because when you think about when someone gets indignant or, or when you get indignant, it says a lot about what you value. You get upset when someone makes you miss your appointment or your show or your ball game or your workout, whatever it is. The kids break your nice new iPhone or whatever it is. Whatever we get indignant about and, and mistreat others, it shows the value of others compared to whatever we got upset about. And him being upset with the disciples hindering the children's access to him, it's showing something of the heart of God. It shows his compassion for the defenseless and the helpless and the vulnerable. His indignation is a righteous indignation. It's a right priority. His anger says, don't you treat these little ones as unimportant. Don't you oppress the lowly. Don't, don't you be a hindrance. Rather, you should be the kind of people who bring them to me. Let them come to me. 
Now we see that teaching, and I think it's good for us to stop and say, well, what do we learn from this? How do we keep from being a hindrance to children, keep from disregarding them? And I went through a number of commentaries, and there was a whole range of suggestions as how this works out, how we treat kids as important. And suggestions range from being advocates for their rights and protections, both locally and internationally. It ranges all the way to, hey, you need to bring them to, to church and make camps for them and special events for kids and treat them as important. And, and I think there's merit to all these things. And if you think about it, certainly in some international communities, you have endangered species which actually have more protection than some of the kids. This, this whole agenda of, of treating these creatures more important than those made in the image of God. In our own country, the, the rights of the unborn have been set aside for the supposed rights and choices and, and freedoms and conveniences of those who would abort. We're cast off and disregard those made in the image of God. So those things are, are, are right and good to consider. But more important to the point of the passage here, we want to bring little ones to Jesus so that they can have eternal blessings. Now, how does this work out when we don't have Jesus physically present? All right. There's a couple ways I think that are helpful to think about. We, how do we bring people to Jesus but to bring them to his word and his truth? so that they would know him, what he's about, and, and what his gospel is. And, and also, by living the way of Christ in front of them. Basically, you need to Deuteronomy 6 them. Right? You, you need to take that passage we read earlier, and, and you need to make that a verb in your life, where you are actually doing what it says in Deuteronomy 6. You remember verse 7, it says, you, you need to teach them the Lord's ways. Teach them diligently to your children and, and make your life all about it. You're going to talk about the Lord's ways when you, when you sit down, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. It should permeate your life. The New Testament version of that is in Ephesians 6, 4, where it says that you should bring up your children in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. I mean, that's particularly a responsibility for families, particularly fathers even, within the family. And doing things like that might might mean that we need to increase our influence in our children's lives or maybe decrease the influence also of, of the media and culture and worldly peer relationships so that we might be able to teach Jesus' ways, to bring them to Jesus. It's through the Bible, through, through prayer, and, and yes, things like corporate worship. And we might think, well, they can't learn much, but they can see you. Because if you remember in Deuteronomy 6, it was directed to adults, to the parents. Deuteronomy 6 says the parents need to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Our living is a testimony, and our living can be a hindrance as well. Our, our, our lives need to back up our words because kids can tell our hypocrisy, and that can be a hindrance. They, they can tell the differences, one author says, between duty and delight. Whether you actually possess these things. We can't give them what we don't possess. And sometimes they learn more from our lives than from our lectures. And we're not talking that we do things perfectly. We don't do things perfectly. Sometimes what we're modeling is, is humble repentance when we do wrong. And the great love of God who will forgive us. They don't need to just see rules. They need to see the gospel lived out and how we deal with our own failures. Are, are you teaching your children God's great love? How he's loved you in Christ and, and how they need a savior? In, in our worship, are we expressing something of the, the love of God together? And, and we, we can do a lot in our culture to try and show the importance of children. We're in a very child-centered phase of our culture right now where there's all sorts of things centered on children and families revolve around the children's activities and we can give them all sorts of good things and, and nice toys and all sorts of activities but we can't miss the most important thing to bring them to Jesus know his ways 
I hope as, as, as a church we can grow in these things. And as a church, we want to teach parents. We also want to teach children. We're in the middle hour. We're, we're, we're having great truths being proclaimed. But we really want to come alongside parents to, to see kids brought to Jesus. I pray we all grow in taking time for kids and, and figuring out how to embrace them rather than dismiss them. Like, like Jesus does. None of them are too small that he won't take the time. We have a God who doesn't run out of capacity to deal with people. It's not like he has these important things to deal with and he, he can't deal with these little things. He calls us, everyone, to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. So that's thinking about the application a little bit. As we, as we go back to the text, you know, moving into the next point here, we see that, that Jesus, he doesn't just tell his disciples what to do. He doesn't just tell them, let the children come. He, he gives a reason. He gives an explanation for his response and his commands to them. And in the middle of verse 14 there, he says, for the kingdom of God, meaning because. Why should the little children come to him? Because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He's not just saying, be nice to children because I'm nice to children. No, he's holding them up as an example such as these, it's, it's the language of comparison. He's, he's making some kind of correspondence about those who are saved and little children. And, and that's your, your next lesson here, being like children. So what is it about a child that corresponds the way we receive, the way anybody receives the kingdom of God, gets into heaven? Now, some say it's because of their innocence. I don't think those people have kids when they say that, right? They, they can be selfish, they can be demanding, they can be short-tempered. Proverbs says that folly is just bound up in their heart. The Psalms talk about how, you know, I was conceived in sin and born in iniquity, right? And we see throughout scriptures where you know, depravity seeps out and kids, it's there. And we do see it. So this childlikeness I don't think it refers to any inherent qualities that the children possess. It's not about childlike faith either. This passage doesn't say anything about faith. Well, there might be a relation to it. No, the kids are examples not because of what they have, but because of what they lack. They lack power. They lack status. They lack influence. They, they lack merit. They have no claims for themselves to be able to have an audience with Jesus. And the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. We're not, we're not talking about an age. It's, it's more about a condition or a status. We're not talking about a three-year-old entering heaven, but the condition of a three-year-old or a 30-year-old that they need to have to be saved. This is so opposite of the disciples' thinking. See, the very reason that the disciples hindered the children from coming, they didn't have anything to offer, they were, they were powerless, they were dependent, they were vulnerable, that's the very reason that Jesus wanted them to come to him. Because he came to serve, not to be served. He came to give of himself to needy people to bring them to himself and to life and to blessing. And, and you think about it, no wonder he would receive them. They're the epitome of the needy, and he is the epitome of the giver. And, and that neediness and dependence needs to be true of anyone who would enter the kingdom. You need to understand that they're helpless and undeserving and have no merit of my own as the him goes. And that the only way that anyone can enter the Lord's blessings is because of his goodness and grace, not anything on their own. And, and Jesus, he drives that point home in verse 15. He, he says, truly I say to you, basically saying, listen up, this is important. If you don't receive the kingdom like a child, you won't enter it at all. If you somehow think that you're worthy of God's acceptance on your own because of your own status, your goodness, your righteousness, you're never going to enter. No, you need to 
receive it. I need to receive it. You accept it with no claim, no credit. It's just a sheer neediness. And, and, and I think we understand how kids can do this. They'll receive a gift from you that you offer them. They don't feel compelled to have to pay you back or, or, or feel like they have to earn it. I mean, offer a kid an ice cream cone. He just takes it and he doesn't say, oh, I'll get you next time. Or, or here, let, let, let me contribute to it a little bit. They'll just take it. Openly and confidently, they'll just take it. But adults don't always do that, do we? We do say, oh, here, let me give you something for that. I'll get you next time. We can be proud. And we live in a world where we're constantly putting merit forward to gain access. Whether it's a a job interview or some sports tryout or a a musical audition or when you're on a first date, you're always trying to put forward all you got going on so that you might gain access. But that's not the way it works with the kingdom. It might be how every other religion works. That may be how you try and work sometimes, where we think we, we have to earn ourselves or actualize ourselves to some higher state so that, that we can be seen as good, or maybe we have to keep his commandments or, or something like that. Something in our own strength that we have to muster up. We want to be able to carry ourselves into heaven. But a child doesn't mind resting in the strength of another. I think of my little boy when he's feeling weak and tired, how he just will reach up his little arms and want to be carried. He doesn't mind his daddy's strength. He can receive it openly and confidently. Do you receive Jesus like that? Are you like a little child or or, or, are we like the opposite? where we're trying to earn our entrance. Yeah, yes, maybe you've been saved by the Spirit, but you're trying to finish it in the flesh, as Paul says in Galatians. And we'll see more of this next week, because what Mark is doing here, in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, they have this account immediately followed by the account of the rich young ruler. And there's a deliberate contrast here between the empty-handed reception of the kingdom like a little child on the one hand and the attitude of the rich young ruler and even the disciples on the other hand. And the rich, the rich man asks, what must I do? What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And then he goes on and he, and he, he claims that he's kept all the commandments and he wants to talk about all that he's done in order to gain God's favor. It's just too common uh, of a perception of what it means to get in heaven. And and we hear things through this legalistic grid where we think doing good or keeping commandments gets us in, and we functionally can fall into that. We're we're not talking about doing works to gain heaven. No, we're we're talking about gospel-centered grace, which changes us such that it does do works. And what's Jesus tell the man that we'll look at next week? He says, you are lacking. It's not enough. It's never enough. You don't just need to add more works to what you're doing. It's what you need to add is a heart like a child. And we need to recognize that we need a heart like a child. That we would just come and receive, not strive to deserve. He needed to recognize his weakness, not rely on his strength. As it's been said before, only empty hands can be filled. And and with these two accounts of of the children and the rich young ruler, we, we basically have a picture of right and wrong ways to enter the kingdom, to get to heaven. And the disciples, they're they're leaning more towards the side of the thinking of the rich young ruler. They're acting like, yeah, children aren't useful to the kingdom until they're grown-ups. But Jesus says, grown-ups can't enter the kingdom until they become like children. You can't claim a right. You can't boast in your status. You can't earn your way in. And there is no other way. Unless we receive it, 
on that basis will never enter. Do you understand why Jesus is so indignant? Why, why he reacted so strongly? It's because the gospel's at stake. This is about everyone who would enter heaven. This is about salvation. And, and the gospel is about what God has done for helpless sinners. The gospel isn't primarily about advice on how to live. It's news about what God has done. And when we recognize our helpless state, that we're dead in our sins, we're unable to free ourselves from the penalty, we're helpless and we're doomed to hell on our own, and we recognize that God gives us grace in Christ, that he takes away the penalty of our sin through his death, that he sets before us eternity if we would trust in him and gives eternal life through his resurrection life, then we can gladly receive the gift openly and confidently, not trying to put forward merit on our own, no claims, but total dependence. And what we receive is is not just something that's a reward later. We receive a status now where we can be called children of God, where we can be adopted into his family. And and like like a little orphan who doesn't have any parents, it's a beautiful thing when they can be brought into the loving family. And this is a loving family of our God where we can be called his children. That's how being like a child relates to the gospel. Only when we have this heart, this mindset, can we put faith in him. Yes, we exercise faith, but we need this heart to recognize that we need it. The heart of a child. So just as Jesus calls these children to himself, he, he calls sinners, those who are poor and needy on our own, to come to him. Some of you might think, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with Jesus. I'm doing okay. I, I'm not a real bad person. But if you haven't come to Jesus this way and recognize that we all fall short of the glory of God and sin in many ways, then you won't enter. Or you might think, on the other hand, that I have so messed up my life. I've sinned so terribly against the Lord. But Jesus says he'll welcome all who come to him. He came for the needy, for sinners, those who recognize that they have sinned and fall short. And Jesus says in the Gospel of John, whoever comes to me, I will by no means cast out. So let's go to Jesus. Let's humble ourselves day by day, like a child trusting him to forgive your sins, to believe on him, not for yourself, and you shall be saved. And he will bless you forevermore and never let you out of his embrace. Father, we thank you for the good news that we have in your son that he stands ready to welcome us, to save us, full of mercy, love, and power. Help us to come humbly to you as little children. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.